the session and also live streaming it online. So you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Actually, I was talking, but I forgot to unmute myself. So thank you for a great welcome. And I greet you all um, uh, uh, esteemed scholars who are joining from different uh, countries. And, and I see now here we've got people from as far as um, India, Germany, US, uh, Portugal as well, and Switzerland, and we've got people from Brazil, we've got people from the RSA, South Africa, and we've got people from many, many countries, Lithuania, Bosnia, and all uh, uh, people who've registered that are here, and we greet you all of you, and we greet you even those that are joining us on live streaming via Facebook. We greet you uh, qualitative research enthusiasts and uh, scholars collectively. I do believe we're gonna have a great session talking about what we actually all love. That is why we are here. And, and so I just wanna present uh, first the outline of the program so you could actually have an expectation of things that we will be covering. So we'll be going through First, I'll just talk a little bit about our affiliation and then uh, give a background to why we're doing what we do. And then uh, talk about thematic analysis in our uh, uh, perspective and its origins and the practical aspects and then integration into the Costa model and then uh, obviously software integration as well. So I'm looking forward to have a, a great session with all of you. As you can see uh, on the screen, I'm from the Global Center for Academic Research and uh, based in Johannesburg, South Africa, Johannesburg and Pretoria as well. And we're dealing with students uh, all over the country and even beyond, helping them with research methods. We consider ourselves as methodologies. We are passionate about methods. And so for that, we also work or affiliated with the university, uh, South Valley University based in Zambia and Amadi University College based in Swaziland that helps uh, us uh, to be literally global, uh, particularly starting at home. You know, they say charity begins at home. So we're trying to actually make our presence in the SADAC region so that as we go out uh, uh, to other areas of the world, but we actually are also making a contribution where we're coming from. Um, a background to the work that I'm going to be presenting now started uh, as far back as 2018 when we established the Global Center for Academic Research. Uh, and, and so what we looked at was the challenges that were faced by students. Uh, and, and, and the question we had was, why is it that many students are enrolling at postgraduate uh, uh, postgraduate level for masters and PhD, but at the end of the term you get far less than uh, the number that actually enrolled. What could the problem be? And our study found out that the problems were issues related to the research language or uh, capacity, uh, the concept called supervisor burden at one time or some unresolved challenges between supervisor and the research uh, office of the university, or in also involving the student and sometimes even external examiners. So this is where the problem was. And then we took further and say, what are other challenges? And then we found out that challenges that were related to uh, the research language could be actually summed up as uh, concepts. And I'll go back to what you are seeing on the screen. But the, the, the concepts uh, formed part of a five-staged approach and which we called the COSTA program because of the, each stage and, you know, each, 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 each stage, uh, what it signifies. The first stage being concepts. I believe that everything that you want to do, you need to understand the language first. 
And the research language is a language that is not spoken on a daily basis. We don't go around talking about epistemology or anthology or ethnography and all those kind of concepts become extremely complicated and, and very complex if you are meeting them for the first time and, and you've got to be now conducting an investigation using that language. So we felt that students need to understand concepts because once they understand concepts, then everything will be easier. We don't believe that you will get all the concepts because there's just too much to learn, but the basics uh, uh, we felt that had to be in place and that gave rise or birth to the Costa model, which almost is the same as my surname, but really it's got no relationship except that the relationship I was involved in its development. And, and so the model now has been published uh, as a section in an ebook published in Portugal by Ludo Media. And it's also aspects of the work that we've been doing are also published in, uh, through the University of Washington in the USA. So uh, this is what we, I just wanted to give you a background to what are we talking about when we say within the Costa uh, research model. So the, that model, really is a, a collection of ideas that makes the life of the researcher to be much more easier yet adhering to standards uh, that are required for a uh, demonstration of rigor and believability of a student's output. So that's what the Costa model is about. And you'll see that we say we, we drive uh, to, uh, to help students and researchers to internalize the language itself, because as I'm speaking English, I've internalized English to be able to articulate what I'm saying. Even the research language is just like that. It requires somebody else to learn and, and understand it so that they can communicate what they are actually trying to say. But also, you've got to love it. And I, I usually call it the labor of, of, of love. You, it, it's complex, but if you've got love, then you are able to get to the next level where you complete it. So now, the, the Costa model of, of research really, like I said, is ideas that are not really that novel, but except that the structure is novel. Uh, for instance, if you look at thematic analysis, which is actually where the Costa model is based. Thematic analysis uh, originates from a content analysis and content analysis is a method on its own, yet it's so flexible that you can actually also use it for analyzing data. But when you analyze data through content analysis, then there are different divisions that uh, are, are applicable depending on what you really want to do at that particular time. And uh, so content analysis on its own, it's based on three uh, divisions or three categories. And these are the categories that are actually the basis of, the, of our model of analysis. If you look at what you're seeing on the screen, uh, you'll see that one dimension of content analysis is conventional analysis or, or is conventional approach. A conventional approach looks at coding directly, coding data directly from your, uh, your, your data document. So from, from inductively, from whatever you are looking at, the documents that you, you are actually trying to analyze. So direct coding from that uh, would fit in within conventional approach. I actually once conducted a study as well on, uh, on the cause of panic at the outbreak of COVID-19. And I used content analysis and the method that was used there was based basically conventional approach. So the directed one, it's uh, also uh, helpful and useful to what we do because the directed has got this connotation of having some form of a, 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 a priori terms or theories or a priori concepts that you are going to use to link your study and I'll get into detail about that as we go on. And then you've got the summative as well. And the summative approach requires counting and comparisons of keywords and content, the frequencies that these words keep on coming up of your data, very, very important. So our model has actually uh, 
it's based on these three legs or this triad and it seeks to find solutions to make a uh, data much more understandable but as well to as, uh, present rigorous approaches to analysis now let us look at the application of content analysis so that you could see where thematic analysis fits in so you'll see that i've got the disciplines on the left hand side and then i've got the method that is used on the right hand side so within human sciences and linguistic uh, you would use discourse analysis. This morning, I attended uh, also an e-conference from the Asian Qualitative Research, and one of the speakers was actually presenting on uh, discourse analysis, which really looks at linguistics or analyzing human uh, uh, language and, and content, the way it is used. However, in business or social uh, sciences and even anthropology, Thematic analysis, which focuses mainly on themes, becomes the easier approach to actually analyze your data uh, by looking at the themes and some people go into it with themes already a priori or others actually find the themes. The best way is to actually allow the data to bring you the themes so that you could be able to get what is happening. So thematic analysis on its own, as I said, it looks at these themes, how distinct the themes are, how related these themes or these categories are, and then also the number of or the occurrence uh, or the repetition of these uh, of, of certain aspects of concepts or what you'd call relational analysis. In other words, these relationships, how do they continue, how, how, how are they related to each other as they continually occur? And also what is critical is the messages that we are learning out of our data. It could be a message that is communicated to a particular setting of uh, your, your, your research. Uh, what messages are actually going out? Or what messages are we getting from our participants? How are messages received? And what, what meaning do they, are they attaching to these messages? But as well as if the purpose of the message is actually achieving what it is made up for. And how do the participants or recipients of your message, of your communication uh, responding? How is it actually helping them? So this is the fun of thematic analysis and how we've actually uh, uh, tried to build it within our model. And, and the model is seeking to solve some of the complex challenges faced by postgraduate researchers, but not only postgraduate researchers, business researchers, as you've seen in the previous slide, that this method can also be used or is applicable in, 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 in business and social sciences alike. And one of the things that we are actually getting into is to get into businesses right now and help them and show them how they could actually use our method and simplify it. And I'll get into that as we go on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on the slide, you will see that there are six uh, uh, sequential stages of uh, qualitative uh, data analysis. And I believe most of you are familiar with these because this is a conventional approach, starting with uh, your data tools and understanding your data tools and what you need. And I, when we are at this stage, I advise researchers the importance of having clearly identified the methods that you're going to be using in collection of data. If we don't get it right from the time of collecting data, then it becomes very difficult when it is time now to analyze what we believe we've been collecting. So we use quite a number of uh, tools, as you can see, displayed there, including what we also call uh, audio recordings. So ethical dynamics also kick in there. It's very important for your participants to understand why you are recording and how the recordings are going to be kept. Uh, Professor Tolik recently in one of the uh, presentations he made through the qualitative, uh, the Asian qualitative research addressed broadly the dynamics of confidentiality and anonymity. So this is what the researchers need to actually establish. How are you going to collect or protect the, 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 the uh, anonymity or how are we going to actually ensure anonymity and protect the identities 
of your participants. That's at the stage one. And if you get that agreement with your participants, it makes life much more easier to collect data, recording it, and then now you are actually observing other things around as you are speaking to your participants. One thing that I also must uh, also pass through here is that COVID-19 also changed, uh, shook the way we literally do qualitative research. There was already a discourse, a, a discussion and a debate regarding use of technology beyond simply or merely recording, but to an extent of uh, using an interface of this nature to actually interact with your participants. And I know that quite a number of uh, qualitative researchers still are skeptical about it, but uh, we are also required to come with creative ways of actually doing qualitative research. And this could be actually one of the useful methods. And the nice thing about a recorded message using this kind of an interface and also recording that message, uh, as you can see that my, my presentation is already recorded. So there isn't you know, many separate recordings, it's just one recording. But you are able to go over and over your data and now it moves me to stage two. And stage two is data familiarization. So this is where you are required to go through over and over your data. I usually say word by word, line by line, and over and over again. You get used to the data that you are actually going to analyze and then uh, uh, relate to your targeted audience. So that is start, stage two. It's absolutely critical, uh, ladies and gentlemen, even through the use of software, which is what I'm going to be getting into later on, showing how we have actually now integrated the Costa model onto software. Now, even when you use a software, it is not a quick fix. You would still be required to get familiar with your data. And that would be stage two of familiarization because the first stage is when you are busy collecting data and interacting with your participants. So some form of familiarity is already achieved there. Then the third stage would be obviously initial coding and then agile coding and a final stage. And I would like to Therefore, now into these ones, just demonstrate these, how they happen, and, and what, what labor goes into that kind of, of an approach. So I'll start uh, with your data tools, but just now taking you to where you want to get to stage three. So stage one would have been done, and obviously stage one will present you with transcripts, data documents, field notes, audio clips, quite a number of stuff that you must still sit and make sense about it. And it's like you are thrown in a maze of data and you need to understand tons and tons of, 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 of textual uh, data in front of you, which actually is conveying different messages. As you can see, that slide is metaphorically presenting that kind of an idea. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we are here, what I have seen and a recent uh, study that I've just conducted as well, where I just scanned through quite a number of uh, postgraduate um, uh, reports, I find out that most scholars know about the methods that have to be done. Actually, what I'm presenting is not new to many of, of you ladies and gentlemen and, and, and students. Now, what is interesting then is that in chapter three, you will actually see that the methods are clearly articulated. When you go to the presentation of results to find out how did they do what they said they're gonna do, that's where the challenge is. And usually students, as opposed to actually allowing the data to talk on its own, allowing data to be so genuine and, and speak what it says, they tend to look at the questions, the interview questions that they had from their interview guide, and then start thinking of these questions as themes to be analyzed or themes to bring analysis or a conclusion. Because when you get to the theme stage, already you are indicating that you are actually towards the finality of your analysis. 
Now, this is what I see happening out there. And then you find out that. Question one, so many people said this. This is what uh, their views are about this question, and, and it, which is fine. It's another aspect of presenting. We encourage that because it gives us your ideas about what you saw as you were meeting your participants. But it cannot be the final way, and you'll see why. It can't be the final way because already you started interpreting it. And I know that it might create a confusion because we are talking within an interpretive paradigm. And we know the subjectivity. And we know that you are doing so much to deal with that subjectivity. However, there is also a responsibility, and I believe it's an ethical responsibility on our side as researchers to get to all the extremes of demonstrating how rigor was done. We cannot simply just interpret what the student have said without going deeper into the data. So we really discourage if you would look at this as the only method, there ought to be some forms of supplemental methods that can enhance what you, you, the interpretation of what you see as you are interpreting their responses. So the, the, the coding system allows you for these data to be transformed to significant statements that have got clear meanings. That, and it's not the only time, as much as it becomes the aha moment of your study, of your, your hard work, that aha moment does not suggest the end, but it suggests further attempts to go deeper and deeper and deeper until you get to the actual messages uh, that are in there. So for you to do that, you would need to decide on a trajectory that you'll follow or your coding strategy. And your coding strategy could be made up of one way, as you can see in my, in my T presentation here, you've got the left and the right. And the left, I mean, the, yeah, the left side, I've got a problem with left and right anyway. But the left side represents what you call a priori codes or deductive codes or anchor codes. Yes, I said deductive codes, yet the study is not a deductive study. Remember, we know mainly deduction in, um, in, in quantitative paradigm, but here we are, and we're talking qualitative, but we're talking deductive. Yes, from the fact that you are coming up with these codes upfront or a priori codes that you are bringing into your analysis, they are helping you. These codes are derived from your research question or your topic. And I am praying that your research question talks to your topic, because if the research question is not the same as topic, this gives a connotation of two different studies. So it's very important that the topic talks to the research question so that the variables that appear in the question are the same as those that appear in the topic. Those variables, when we get to the time of doing analysis, we use them as anchor codes to literally anchor what we call inductive or I mean, posterior codes or significant statements that come from your data. These significant statements are, are significant to you as the researcher. Why? of the aspects of the concepts that are coming from your data are those that you probably identified when you were doing a literature review. And again, aha, here they are in the data that comes from your participants. But secondly, you will find out that these significant statements make, they, they actually attracted your attention just spot on, just like that. And you wanted to find out what was happening with this particular statement. And thirdly, these significant statements could also result from the fact that uh, the words keep on being repeated all the time and they are attached to a certain uh, aspect. So your coding strategy then, as postulated by Johnny Saldana uh, and, and, and integrated in Mandan Velas's study, one of the greatest labor of love we also heard when he was doing his masters 
And you will see that most of what we are talking about is also reflected in his analysis there. So you would use emo emotion coding, which looks at the sentiment that you are picking as you are coding your data, or value coding that is attached to belief systems or religious, uh, religious approaches of your participants, and then the descriptive uh, co strategy of coding that looks at, that describes situations as they are, as you saw them. And then in vivo, obviously, this is where now you are actually coding your participants directly. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm only showing four which keep on coming all the time when we work on, 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 on research. But there is about 32 strategies uh, that that were actually uh, listed by Onebuzi, and I'll show him now. I'll show that 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 researcher. But there, there, there's quite a number of them. You just have to familiarize with them, which means before you get to data analysis, it's important that you acquire yourself a good training on analysis. Don't just hit immediately for the purposes of completing your study, but you need to understand exactly what did you do and why did you do what you did when you were doing it that is enhancing the rigor and the methodology uh, uh, the methodology which is required as as one of the you know criteria for soundness of your study why is that repeating itself or oh, that stage stage, uh, stage three now that you've made your mind how you're gonna go into your data now that you've thought deeply and reflected on strategies that you're going to use, is it going to be emotion coding? Is it going to be in vivo coding? Is it going to be uh, a, a situational coding? Or is it going to be any of these methods that I said there are about 32 of them? So now that you've made your decision, you get into the data document. The data document may or most of the time is the transcribed uh, version of your interview. Uh, so that becomes your data document. So that conversation you are having with your participants, now it translates, uh, it's in a paper format, now we get into coding, uh, coding that material. Most of us, we know about this. It's nothing new to most of us. As a matter of fact, uh, we always do this. Now here is the interesting part. Now, if you remember the previous, the, one of the previous slides that shows data in some form of a word, on the right hand side, those review comments become your in. When you start to use the process of reduction or cleaning your, 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 your data, you now remove them and then you are going to be looking at these as your codes and leaving the data document as a reference should there be a need for audit trail or verification, which I'll talk about it a little bit later. So you get to an initial stage. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most difficult stage. You've transposed your codes. Now you need to be able to count your codes and you need to be looking at a relationship so you can use any form, whether it's a, a, there's a color code that you are seeing there, but there is danger as well. And I have seen this many times as I've been involved with it. The danger is a human error when you are doing this counting. You are likely not to get the right information. And if you don't get the right information uh, because of an error that you've made, it could actually affect the, the, the conclusions that you have about the study. So you've got, you can see how much data you put. It takes us sometimes weeks and weeks and weeks just to be able to get to this level. And, 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 and it needs high mental alertness to be able to do that. And you are not, it's not even the end of it because now that you've actually uh, got to this stage, you've got to go to the second stage or it's still the first stage here. And then you could just one of the assessed um, documents. Now you gotta get to a stage where you start to relate these codes, but you are doing it manually. That's where the challenge is, because now you've got to be a referee and a player at the same time. And it already affects a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of belie believability of your outcomes, uh, because you are playing and you are also a referee at the same time. 
Some people feel that at this stage is the time to get involved with uh, coding partners as well. But there's still a, a chance of a lot of errors because, ladies and gentlemen, we know that this is a subjective approach. So we need to do as much as we can to actually uh, bracket that subjectivity uh, so much that rigor and believability remains. You can see how, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work just to think of these and, 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 and count them and you are doing it manually. It's a problem. But finally, you get to the joy. You now have observed your data and it was not a once-off thing. It's an iterative process. So you've been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you started to observe certain behaviors of your data as they were forming categories, as they were getting related to particular groups, and they give you some kind of a thing, which it, it's incumbent upon you to be able to actually define these themes. What is the meaning of this theme? That's an example of one of the studies I referred to. But also you are able now to present your study in a form of word clouds, which we all know about, most of us. And uh, that, that helps because even that word, word, word cloud, it actually shows the frequency of words that actually came in, in in your analysis. And then that helps now to go into your rigor. Now, within qualitative dimension, uh, Sonia, I'm not sure how much time I still have. You're fine. You still have uh, okay. almost 30 minutes. Okay. I'm just about to get there. So when we get to that level of demonstrating rigor, you'll see that this light that you're seeing in front of you, right at the middle, is the four-dimensional uh, criteria that is always uh, required for uh, demonstrating rigor of qualitative research, and as postulated by Lincoln and Guba, but uh, also uh, uh, and, and quite a number of, uh, I mean, Guba and Lincoln, and quite a number of uh, authors in qualitative research. So that's the four criteria. And now we need an ability to demonstrate it. As a matter of fact, there's quite a number of articles that are proposing some ideas to enhance the way we actually are demonstrating that rigor in terms of the four, uh, four quality criteria that we know currently. This is just one of the interesting articles that uh, looks at how we actually come to conclusions. And ladies and gentlemen, to a certain extent, we get accused that our conclusions do not have strong soundness uh, and believability because we rely on the subjectivity that we actually present in there. We don't have much to show to actually say this, th these conclusions are supported by this kind of evidence. And therefore, we need to go beyond, beyond the norm uh, within the four quality criteria, still addressing them, but at least go beyond, in other words, beyond the telling there ought to be a demonstration that the telling is supported by what we actually have done. And I'll come into that. And, and that therefore requires what we talk of as generalizability. Now, I know it's, it's, it's mostly a controversial term uh, to use in qualitative dimensions because we know a general, generalizability, that word is also difficult. It's a, a, a it's you know, more customary in quantitative dynamics. But yes, we can actually generalize in qualitative research because certain aspects that we're dealing with can actually be portable beyond the participants' context or the setting itself. And I'll be demonstrating, as you can see even in, in, in this presentation, quite a number of uh, known qualitative authors are actually sub, sub, supporting that for us to understand uh, which is the key objective of qualitative research uh, coming from the German sociologist Max Weber, who, who actually coined this was to actually, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that word, rest him, but it, to understand that's what we're looking for. Now, there are many methods that we could use and we're gonna be proposing them within the Costa uh, qualitative um, 
data analysis method? How could we actually enhance the ability to understand what the data, the data is saying, as you can see now? Here are some of the scholars that, that, that have complained. One of the areas we are accused on is legitimizing our conclusions. How do we legitimize what we say? And then also we know that effect and size estimation are concepts of quantitative research. But we are only asking the particular size that you are dealing with, what was actually some of the effect of the, uh, what came out within that particular, that particular uh, uh, sample that you are dealing with? What are the patterns that came out of that? And to what degree and magnitude? That's what we need to understand. But also precision of accounts that helps us now to demonstrate. And this, ladies and gentlemen, has been supported by quite a number of, stud uh, of studies and, and such as the ones that you are seeing on the screen now. And, and then a lot more than what I have actually put up here. As a matter of fact, the generalizability is much more feasible in qualitative research. As you can see on this uh, slide here, that the classical one, which is used to quantitative because it's statistical, but we have methods and, and it, it's anal analytic generalizability. The analytic methods and tools that we are using, are they assisting us to actually uh, uh, say this is possible or is, are they proving possibility in another context? And then you've got also case by case generalizability, which is inherent in, in, in the 4D criteria as known as transferability. How do we do that? That is where therefore now counting becomes important and you can't do that without reliance of a, a, a good software that you could use. And that's where I come into now software integration. How do you use it? It does not do the coding for yourself. And many people thought that software do coding. No, it's not doing the coding for yourself. You still have to do and follow all methods and use your right mind, frame of mind, will only help you to count. No, the reason we count, as I've shown in the previous slide, there's quite a number of studies, and this is just one, some of the reasons. They are helping us to demonstrate that rigor, and we can only be able to do that using software. I mean, there's one of the studies that we are looking at. We came up with, I won't even mention, codes, so many codes, and we are worried for that a potential risk of having missed setting because we're doing it by hand, by our own, you know, without a, a support of the software. And then we had to actually, that's where we had to migrate our ideas to look for a software that we can actually work that could be flexible and that could allow multiple, you know, uh, participants on. We also count because we want to establish the significance of this research project. But we also want to document what is already known about the problem. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, research is also to deal with issues of certainty and uncertainty at the same time. So what is actually known? How can we help to take it much more further? And to be able to describe the sample in terms of what came out in the analysis beyond just text, but the occurrences, the repetition of certain aspects. One of the studies, again, that we're dealing with looks at uh, intimate partner violence. And what we are looking at there is how many, because we need to understand why are partners actually getting involved? We're looking at male partners who in, uh, perpetrate uh, violence against their female partners. And what we wanted to understand with this particular student is what drives the, the, the perpetrators to conduct what they conduct. And things that we are finding because of use of technology are interesting. One of them is the repetition of certain words like anger, like, like, like frustration, like peer pressure. So th that helps you now to know what came out of your participants. Is it possible that we could now take it across? Could we find the same thing? But also, ladies and gentlemen, this helps again for methods to be replicated. For someone else to do that and find something closer to that, there are chances that you cannot get this because this is a, a difficult work. But
fact helps other researchers first to confirm what you are saying and secondly to be able to find something that is closer to that this is hard work if you're gonna do this kind of stuff without a software and this is where some of you know about the web qda actually web qda are partners in this presentation right now it allows researchers to be able to actually use a method a friendly method flexible method uh, that is very very suitable and useful for uh, the costa method and one of its beautiful features is allowing different participants from remotely you know you know someone could be in a other areas that you are actually but we could be able to work on a particular pro project that's just one of those advantages that we have i'm just showing what the software comes brings and it brings this kind of things with much precision much precision right let me see why is my slide moving over and over on the same thing okay um, all right and then you are able now to come up with another aspect that might still be viewed as controversial but to be honest it is not when i ask you how many participants did you see what were characteristics of these participants it would be much more easier for me to see if i were to look at something like i'm seeing on the screen but even for your codes like i talked about what the study we are conducting right now how much did the phenomenon of anger uh, present itself across all participants in the data document only a credible software can help you to do that but you are still the driver i think uh, i have come to the end of my presentation if there are many questions or any questions perhaps we can deal with them over to you again sonia thank you dr costa thank you very much uh, for a powerful, a powerful presentation. I suppose we can um, we see the questions and comments of our attendees now. If, uh, if they can uh, connect their microphones or use the chat window. Right. Uh, any questions or comments? Feel free to connect your webcams as well so we can see you. For some reason, I'm not hearing you, Sonia. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I was asking our attendees to connect their microphones and their webcams if they have any questions or comments. All right, okay. So we can start a bit of a discussion here. I'm sure there are many comments on the presentation, which has been really powerful. Yeah, I'm trying to also go through the chat just to see if there is anything. I'm not seeing questions. Um, so while there are no questions, I would be actually inviting uh, scholars on the platform to look forward to actually seeking methods that can enhance and make it easier for them to do their qualitative data analysis. And if anybody would be really looking for uh, uh, advice, would be willing to share with them and say, share how the software works. The advantage of the Costa model is that it is now available through the WebQDA to different scholars in different areas. And so we'll be able to take you through it. But what helps you with that is that you are able to present data as raw as it is and then transform that data and make it to be meaningful chunks of information that helps for decision making. Thank you once more. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Otherwise, we will- yeah, Sonia, may I come in please? Sure. Thank you. Hello, uh, Dr. Costa, Welcome. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Costa, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really powerful stuff. I think for me, what it does, <coughs> excuse me, is that it unclutters my mind and my thinking around the process. Uh, it creates a, a very scientific structure that um, 
can be applied very effectively through what is generally a very difficult, uh, complex and stressful part of one's research. I think also what it does for me is that it brings home, uh, in conjunction with the, with the software, it brings home a sense of confidence that the data is going to follow through quite a scientific logical process. And therefore then, very useful, Absolutely. very important, yes, very useful, very important insights uh, that may otherwise fall through the cracks. It gets caught in the net. And, 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 and what I can therefore conclude, Dr. Costa, is that the, the output, the research output, the conclusions, the, you know, basically bringing the whole research to a message um, in one's research report, I think is, is going to be highly elevated. So I'm very encouraged with the, uh, with the structure, with the, the scientific detail around it. And I think students will find it extremely uh, easier, if I may put it that way, to navigate through the, uh, the analysis of data and drawing, drawing off the conclusion. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rajesh. And what it adds as well, they're not only just navigating it, there's so much fun going through it. Most of the students that we've worked with, they can actually always remember, and I do believe they are now able to share that information and help other people. There's just so much fun to see the work that you've done so hard and, and coming up with now new information, what you call emergent information that just came out of the data without you manipulating it, allowing your data to speak on, on, on its own and coming up with conclusions that will actually help to shape, shape the societies that we live in because good research is not only to sit somewhere in some shelves, but it should actually be used and consumed for practice. Mm. Thank you. No, no, indeed, Dr. Costa. So there's the, the continuum in terms of learning a scientific methodology uh, in this part of one's qualitative research, meaning the collation of the information and the analysis and drawing of one's conclusion is something that would be carried through. But I also believe that when one's research report is subject to scrutiny by examiners and, and, and other peers, uh, you know, it would really stand up to scrutiny and it would vindicate itself um, in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Costa, we, we have another, do you have, want to add something? I know that's fine. Um, unless if there's another comment or question again. Yes, we have uh, uh, some questions in the chat window and uh, I don't know if you want to read them directly. Let me see. Um, Maybe I've got to put down my, let's see, oh, there, there, okay. So there's a question there, let's see. Oh, Adrian said they could not hear me clearly. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Adrian. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, but further in the chat, uh, right at the end, we have some questions from Gail Parker and Lucas Cossi. Okay, let's see. Um, Lucas and Cos. Oh, yeah, there's Gail. Very empowering. I feel like you could have. Okay, now that's. Uh, Gail feels like we could have continued. Uh, so, Gail, you heard me, I guess. I'm not sure why other areas, uh, the, the audibility was not that clear, but I'm sorry about that. And then Lucas, all right. Lucas is looking forward to the slides himself. And then, okay, there's a question from Gail. If there are more than 30 methods of doing data analysis, how do you decide which? Okay, no, these are not methods of doing data analysis, uh, Gail, but these are coding strategies. And um, uh, you could get, uh, I, I think perhaps, I'll, because I know you all provide you some of the details about that article as well that you can look at. Uh, or the work of Johnny Saldana, because he's the one who's actually leading on this uh, coding approach. And, and others as well. But it's not, it's, it's, it's not uh, methods, but these are strategies that you keep in mind so that you can use a uh, through coding. For instance, if you are seeing anger as some of your codes, you could link them to emotion coding, you know, 
And then if you want to interpret or quote the people as they were saying, you could link that to um, in vivo coding. Right. I hope I've answered that. Somebody joined late. Question, is it too compulsory of the language of academic research to be kept at the level of big words? Well, you, it doesn't have to be big words, but academic language is really different from the type of language that we use on a daily basis. And uh, so you, we've got to try and, and, and really represent and, and, and talk at the language uh, that's required. For instance, there are certain words that you cannot use, like handy, and actually I'm the one of the culprit uh, on some of the languages, the language style that you use. So you've got to write as someone who is a master, who is, who is researching something that really has got to be taken serious and solve problems out there. All right. I, I think I've responded to some of these, uh, Gail, I mean, uh, Sonia. Uh, there is another question from Gail Parker. When you translate the interviews conducted during your research to English for purposes of analysis, is there any danger that some meaning may be lost and possibly distort the codes? Um, that, that, that's a very, very interesting uh, question again, Gail. If you, what is more important to get rich data is to first interview people in their own language. And uh, then, obviously, when you translate this uh, information, there is that risk. That is why to deal with that risk, if you get a, a different transcriber, but you still have to read this. And, and now there are many transcribers who practice for just transcriptions only. So you could take it to them who know and are familiar with the language, but because you are also familiar, which is why you interviewed them in the language, it is required for you. It's step number one, which is the way we do the, I mean, step number two, where you do data familiarization. So you've got to go through the, the document over and over again just to see, because you know this, you were there to see if what is being transcribed, is it the same as what you bought in the record? As a matter of fact, these records, you still have to keep them for some time for evidence. So yes, you can deal with that risk. For instance, we used to uh, send some stuff to uh, one of the overseas transcribers, but when it came back, we realized that we had to read because also even if it was in English, English in the US and South Africa and England, it's also different. So there is that risk as well. Okay. Um, Sonia? Yes, Chris, go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Costa, for the uh, well-articulated uh, presentation. Um, I think as a, as a master's or PhD students, we, we just um, find ourselves in the deep end without these uh, um, theoretical background to how to, to, to deal with data. And, uh, you know, this, this provides a structure that even before you, you start with your with you, with your project, um, you you then have to look at all these uh, concepts and and what you have presented, how to deal with data, you know, from the beginning to the end. So so thank you very much. I think um, it, it's a well thought out, well well presented. I mean, well well articulated presentation, and. Um, um, I also feel that it's like you could have gone on and on and on. Uh, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, there is uh, Mary Teresa Moody. Can you do a presentation when you unpack the different coding strategies and when these are most effective? Uh, please. I'm not sure I understand that question, um, uh, Mary. But, oh, Mary, Mary, yes, I know you, Mary, yes. I'm not sure I understand uh, your question clearly. Um, can you do a presentation when, where you are? Um, sorry, oh, you're asking me to do a presentation. Yes, okay. can I explain myself, please? I can hear it now. You are asking me to do a presentation, okay. Yes, please. Is it possible to do a presentation on the different coding strategies? Because you say there's about 32. 
and yes. will be the most effective in what scenarios or explain wh why the different coding strategies and that may exactly. give us some kind of direction on which to use to get the best result when doing our data analysis. Certainly, we can do that, we can arrange that presentation. Thank you, Doc. All right. I'm not seeing anything more now. Oh, um, oh, there's a question from Lucas. I heard Dr. Costa speaking on the need for understanding concepts which will enable postgraduates to cope at mastering the master's and doctoral level. Oh, oh yeah, yes, that, that's true, uh, Lucas. It's very important to know language of everything or anything that you want to do. You need to, un and in research at postgraduate level, it's critical. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Sonia. Well, uh, if there are no further questions or comments. Yes, Roger. Sonia, may I just have a last shot with Doc, if you don't mind? Yes, definitely. You still have Thank a couple you. of minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, Doc, you know, in terms of researcher bias um, creeping into the analysis and drawing of one's conclusions, now, considering the, the Costa model and, of course, the, 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 the software that, that we've spoken about tonight, um, do you feel that it would assist in limiting or rather controlling researcher bias uh, creeping into the analysis and conclusions of, of the data? Right. That's a good question again, Rajesh. Remember one thing that you as a researcher, first of all, you are a main instrument. The main instrument is you because you are the one who deals directly with the data and you are the one who is interpreting it. So first of all, it's very important to be aware of your biases towards um, what you are actually presenting. So it's very important. However, the system even helps because uh, for instance, if we talk about the software, you'll find out that you are able to get certain ideas about the data as it presents itself without your manipulation of any kind. So you just have to be interpreting it. But yes, uh, we, we've got training that we do on also how to use that. But it's very critical that uh, qualitative researchers are aware of their bias. As a matter of fact, that's what we call, there's something we call bracketing, where you can actually recognize yourself the potential for your own bias to actually change the direction of the study. But mm -hmm. the software does help for credibility. Without a, a particular system, even the Costa model, if it is not used on the software we're talking about, it's got problems because at the end of the day, it, it's you telling me, which is important in qualitative research, you've got to tell me. But the question is, how far detached yet you are attached from what you are saying? Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Costa, I think we can call it a day, if it's okay with you. That's fine. I think we've addressed all we could. And thank you so much, uh, Sonia and the team in Portugal. And all those that are watching us on Facebook Live, thank you so much.